So we want to talk about entering into rest. You know, in the Bible, there's, um, there's several words in Hebrew for the word rest. Um, I'm going to cut through the chase on some of this to save some time, okay? But when I started first meditating upon this and thinking about this word and thinking about what is a seat of rest, I started thinking about what is a seat? What is rest? You know, from a Hebraic perspective, from a heavenly perspective, what is the seat of rest? And I'm going to share a secret with you. The heavenly seat of rest is called the mercy seat. That's the seat of rest. Because God would rest upon the mercy seat. And he would meet with the high priest in the old covenant once a year. And the new covenant for all eternity, forever and ever, always. When I first started thinking about this, you know, the first thing that came to mind, because I know that Noah's name means rest. You know, his name in Hebrew means rest. And I started thinking about it. Okay, so the Lord is speaking to me about Noah, and he's speaking to me about the, the mercy seat. Well, both those things are connected to something. An ark. Noah's ark and the ark of the covenant. And they're both pictures. They're both symbolic. Because now, <laughs> you are the ark. We are the ark that carry his presence. We are the ark that carry his heart. The ark of his heart. So I started thinking about those. And I was reading the scriptures, you know, and looking into some of the meaning of the letters. And I also came across, you know, I knew another word that meant rest is the word sabbath or sabbath. You've heard of that. And some religions have you know, taken that and perverted it. And, um, but I want to get back to the true meaning because the word Sabbath or Sabbath means rest. You know, and on the seventh day, what does it say? Genesis 2-2. Anybody ever see 22s? Genesis 2-2. It says that God finished all his work and he rested on the seventh day, a seven. And I've been seeing sevens like crazy. <laughs> And in, this, in my studies, hours of study and deep digging into this, I kept coming across numbers like 7. I kept coming across numbers like 19 and like 9. And see, to me, I know what those mean, what they mean to me anyway. What the Lord has taught me from the Hebraic, you know. And we're in, I know that we're at the ending of a 2019. We're at the ending of a 19 season. So I believe... <laughs> That is strategically important that we understand what rest is and how to enter into the rest of the Lord. How to rest as He rested. How to enter into that place of resting in Him. How to sit upon that seat of rest. Or a better way to say it, how to sit in the seat of rest. So we've got Sabbath. We've got Noah. We've got the mercy seat. And I'll share what that word is a little bit later. We got the ark. We got Noah's ark. And we got the ark of the, the tabernacle. The ark of covenant. That was in Moses' tabernacle. And so we got Noah here. You got Moses here. You know. And we've got Adam in the beginning. Where the father and the son in a garden. That whole relationship thing. And. So I was just thinking about all that. And I realized something. All of that still has to do with trusting in the Lord. So you can't be at rest unless you are in trust. We have to learn to trust Him with your life. The early church did. And we're supposed to be farther along. Greater. There's a greater anointing to come upon the end time church. Than it was even on the early church. There's a greater Pentecost to be experienced. But then there's the greatest feast of all, tabernacles. The indwelling, the habitation of God in our midst. So that's what, you know, that's what we're after. That's what I'm hungry for. So guess what? Noah had to learn to trust the Lord. Noah had to learn to trust the word of the Lord. God gave him a word. that was so crazy and so different, so out there. 
I mean, nobody ever done this before. Hey, hi, Jonah. Nobody had ever built an ark before. Nobody knew what an ark was. They had no clue what Noah was talking about. They thought this guy's fell off his rocker, all right. You know, he's he's grown senile. <laughs> he's he's nuts. God told Noah, gave him a word. Noah had to trust in that word that the Lord gave him. And guess what Noah had to do? Noah built this thing, right? And he was obedient to every word that the Lord gave him. Even though it was crazy to the world, he did it anyway. Anybody ever done anything crazy for the Lord? Because he told you to? I want to give you some assurance today. The Lord told you to. He told you to go after that. He told you to believe in that. He told you to trust Him in that. Now, He's not evil. God is good. There was a purpose in it. You know, I started out this service. I, I heard myself saying something. See, God will always give you the revelation of the thing first. And, and you've got to go after the revelation. And you've got to get a fuller understanding of the revelation before it will ever become a manifestation. First, you get the revelation. And you have to... Let that revelation be revealed to you. That's what revelation means. The unveiling, the revealing of it. The opening of it, first in the spirit and then the natural. Oh, it's coming. That thing that God showed you, that thing that God spoke to you, it's coming. But first there has to be a full revelation. It has to be so full in you that you trust the Lord completely. That you learn how to rest in that word. Now God gave Noah a word. Told him to do it and Noah did it. And then Noah's job was just to get in. The ark was like a seat. Because there was something new. There was a new day coming. And there's anything that I'm hearing from the Lord. It's that there, we're in a new day. That we're at the threshold of this new day. And it's not like all the other new days. This is like the mega day. This is like the day of all days. The new day of all new days. I'm telling you, as a church, as a whole, we're coming into that new day. See, we're at the end of seven, you know, we had the 4,000 years and the 2,000. We're entering into the seventh millennium of this creation. There's, so as far as I go with that, this creation Seven years, seven millenniums, seven days. What do you do on the seventh day? Seventh day is a day of rest. See, everything in Scripture lines up with itself. There's something new that's happening. And what first God is giving the revelation of it. And the fulfillment of this, of what God is speaking and beginning to show us is the coming of Christ. Is establishing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That's what's coming. And there's a millennium coming where Christ rules in the earth for a thousand years. And we rule with him. Got to come in the church and then through the church. He's got to do it in you and then through you. See, you got the revelation. That's what happens in you. But God then begins to, to multiply that thing and it grows in you. Until... Okay, God will always plant it in you first as a seed. You got a seed. You didn't have the full fruition yet. You got a seed. You, you caught a glimpse of something in the Father's heart that He wants to do. The seed is planted in your heart. But then that seed germinates. and has to begin to grow. And that seed begins to multiply and to multiples of itself and that thing begins to grow and grow just like a woman being pregnant the womb see a nine in hebrew is the letter tet it's the ninth letter and it can be a picture that looks like a the womb of a woman it's the womb of the spirit and god impregnates impartates plants in that womb just like he did with mary by overshadowing Tetzalel, the shadow, the overshadowing of God. There's an impartation. There's a pregnancy. Something is birthed in you. And then it begins to grow. And God begins to add understanding to it. Multiple, multiplying it. 
until eventually you can't hide the fact that you're pregnant. <laughs> because it's growing on the inside of you. And that womb is expanding. God has been expanding the womb of our imaginations. God has been expanding our spirit to contain more. Because what's coming is greater than what's been before. And this seed is growing in you. A seed of expectation. Of expectancy. It's a divine seed. It's a divine revelation. That God has planted in you. A divine picture of something. You know you can go to the store and buy a puzzle. A thousand piece puzzle. Now on the front of the box it gives you the picture. That doesn't mean when you open the box the puzzle is all put together. Because it's not is it? It's a mess. <laughs> Every piece is out of place. It, if you just throw it out on the floor, it makes no sense. I mean, you dump that thing out of the box, and it's not going to look like the picture on the front of the box. I don't care how bad you want it to. I don't care how hard you cry and beg and plead. It just isn't going to happen until you put your hands to it. Until you begin to figure out how the pieces fit together. And God begins to give you wisdom and multiplies the understanding in you. And you begin to find another piece that connects with you. And then I find another piece that connects with me. And all of a sudden, I find there's four or five pieces together. And there, a picture begins to form. I begin to see something that I didn't see before. And the more pieces that are joined together and put together, the more people that are enlightened and catch the vision of what God wants to do. Eventually, all the pieces come into place. And all of a sudden... What's in the floor looks like what was on the picture of the box. What was in the store. <laughs> the store being like heaven. The floor being like the earth. All of a sudden what's in the earth begins to reflect the same mirror image of what you saw in heaven. And then the birthing takes place. There's an outworking. A birthing out. That's why the tet when it's formed it's a layer that comes up. But there's a little opening at the top. Because what's in you has to come out of you eventually. It's growing. God is incubating it. God is multiplying it. God is adding to it. Till you have the full picture. And then there is a breakthrough. There is a breaking forth. There is a coming forth of what you saw in the very beginning. In an immature state. Now is matured. To a place where it's ready to be birthed. Just like Mary gave birth to Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus was of his Father, the Heavenly Father. Jesus had to grow into that. He had to mature into that. So one of the signs of maturity is learning to rest. When you learn to rest in God and not worry and fret and try to work it all out on your own. Because <laughs> all that does is make you sweat. We got to go from sweating to resting. We got to stop trying to work it all out because we can't. We can't figure it out. You tell me how to figure out the manifold grace of God, the manifold wisdom of God. I don't know. This thing doesn't compute that, but this does. I just know that I know in my knower that it's right. And so I just take this thing and I rest it in Him. He arrests my heart and I just rest in it. And I know because he showed that it will come to pass. It's going to happen. I mean, I just have to be obedient to do what he says. To go when he says go. To stay when he says stay. To be still when he says be still. To move when he says move. It's called obedience. Jesus learned obedience to the things which he suffered. Oh, don't you wish that verse wasn't in there sometimes. <laughs> Anybody suffered? It's our turn to make up that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. <laughs> Some people don't like that, especially immature people. They don't like that verse. You know what? The early church was persecuted. The early church suffered a lot. But every one of them you saw at the end of their life, they were matured to a place where the suffering was nothing more than a means to an end. They didn't see the suffering. They saw the crown. They didn't see the wooden chair. They saw the throne. They didn't see the crown of thorns. They saw the golden crown 
of royalty. And so they endured like a good soldier. And that's what we have to learn to do. So, 30 is the number of maturity in Hebrew. And I wrote it down somewhere. Let me, oh, it's on here. There are 30 words in the Bible that have a gematria the same as 702, which is the same as the word Sabbath. Large gematria is 702. Small gematria is 9. There's 30 different, 30 words in the Bible that have that same numerical value. That's why 30 speaks of wisdom, maturity. And that's why when you rest... Which is what Sabbath means to rest, the day of rest. When you enter the, to that day of rest, it's a sign of maturity, that you're maturing. Hallelujah. It's just not always fun to get there. Now, this word, let me talk about the word Sabbath first, then I'm going to get back to Noah. We still got the two arcs going. Now, the word Sabbath, okay, pictorially, Hebraically deeper than what you're just going to look up in Strong's, okay? There's three letters, the Shin, the Bait, and the Tav. It's real simple. It's just three letters, three-letter words. You know, we teach the kids at our Christian school. They start learning to read, you know, at three years old. Three, four, five years old, they're reading books, you know. Four years old, they're reading simple books. But they can read three-letter words. We start with three-letter words. You know, you start with one, one letter, and then you add a two-letter, which is a blend, and then they begin to understand some of the phonic principles. And real soon, they're reading three-letter words. See, we're learn So much of the church, we're still trying to learn the sound of a letter. The heavenly letters. We don't even know the sound, the frequency of the heavenly letters yet. We've got to learn that before we can start putting them together. And what is God? God is like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a strand of three. Three frequencies in one. So the Shin Beit Tav, this is what Sabbath or Shabbat or rest in Hebrew, pictorially, this is what it means. You're going to like this, I think. When we. Mm. Hallelujah. By fire, first letter is the Shin, three flames on the head. Remember the day of Pentecost? The fire set on their heads. The Spirit set on them like a fire. By fire, the Spirit will destroy all chaos and create a place of perfection through the Son on a cross. Shabbat. Entering into that rest. Trusting in the full work of redemption. The finished works of the cross. By fire. And that's another thing. The church has experienced the baptism of the Spirit. And it's been good for 2,000 years. But there's a baptism of fire coming. There is a fire coming. And the Lord was saying it through all of worship. I heard three words, fresh. I heard the word fire. And so there's a fresh fire. And then when we sang that song, the word favor was being highlighted to me. Fresh fire and favor upon the church. And it starts with the fire. If God's doing anything right now, He's exposing the junk that's in our lives. He's exposing the stuff to get it out of us, to burn it up with His fire. He's burning up all the junk. He's burning it all up. He's bringing it all out to the surface. You know? That's what I said several months ago now. The Lord show, told me He's removing the guard off of the mouth because we're entering into the decade of the pay. You know, you've been hearing this over and over and over. 80 in Hebrew is the numerical value of the letter pay, the 17th letter. Kim Clement prophesied about it and about the Q, something to do with the Q, the 17th letter in the English and the 17th letter in the Hebrew, the pay. Somehow the Hebrew and the English, there's, there's somehow this, this joining together. You know what, what I see when I, when I even say that? I see America and I see Israel be like joined together like never before. I mean, in an even greater way. <laughs> I think God will honor that, don't you? 
Didn't he say those that bless Israel, he'll bless? Those that curse Israel, he'll... <laughs> Ooh. Anyway, so I'm going to bless Israel. And so, uh, but I see this joining, this coming together of these, these two things. You know, man, if there was ever a true prophet of God, it was Kim Clement. And I, man, I wish he was still here. He's still alive. He's just in heaven now. Hey, it's 12-12. Double government. Fullness of kingdom government on earth. To the number of witness agreement. Something being established. Thank you, Lord. So Shabbat. See, by fire. And it's the fire from heaven. How did God light the fire on the altar? Did, did he tell men to go out and get a bunch of sticks and put it up there and then get some, what do you call it, the flint and strike it together to get the fire? No. He said, you just put it on there and then get your hands off. I'll light the fire. And so it was fire from heaven lit. That fire in the tabernacle. God's the author of the fire. So Sabbat, Sabbath, we have to come into rest. God sends the fire. You don't work up the fire. You can't purge yourself. I'm sorry. You can't purify yourself through good works. It's impossible. It is by His grace. It is by the work of the Spirit in us. Hands off, boys. He told the priest to get your hands off. I'll light the fire. I'll send the fire. Don't you think it maybe kind of... Uh, made a believer out of them when they saw the fire fall from heaven and you think they would uh, would have figured it out but they forget they forgot really quickly so do we we forget really quickly but it's by fire the spirit will destroy all the chaos and create a place of perfection a perfect habitation through the son Yeshua HaMashiach Jesus Christ on a cross how many know that happened so now it's up to us to receive that truth manifest that truth walk in it step out by faith and watch it come to pass okay so let me move on and so I was talking about Noah right and so Noah did everything the Lord instructed him to do and then he then God told Noah to get in just get in, get in. Get in the ark. What is the ark? Place of resting. The seat of rest. The ark represents a seat of rest. The place of the seat of resting in God. So Noah and his family went in. Eight. And what does it say? God shut the door. God shut them in. God covered them. God took something seen and made it unseen. The world could not see Noah any longer. God had enclosed him had come over him, come under him, come around him, had shut him in. God had put Noah into the seat of rest. And what, did, what was Noah's, Noah's choices then? We could have been in there worrying and fretting, wondering. Because you know what? He could hear the waters. He could hear the storm. He could hear the water coming out of the earth. You think that was quiet? Oh, man. You're talking about an outpouring. Noah could hear it all, and he didn't know what it all meant. He didn't have all understanding of everything. He was just being obedient. See, most of the church today, we want the full understanding, and then we might move. <laughs> I said might. But see, God says move, and I'll give you some understanding. The, un the understanding comes when you move and stand under something. In other words, when you get into something, then the understanding comes. I mean, it'd be nice if God would give me some understanding before I got myself in that mess. What I think is a mess. But how many know when you trust in the Lord, He'll take the mess and make it a message? Because it was never intended just to be a mess for you. It was always intended to be a message through you to the whole world. Come on, He'll take the mess and He'll make something beautiful out of it. That tapestry, mess on one side, beauty on the other side. I mean, it looks like a mess when you're going in. It looks like chaos until you come out. Then you see the picture. Then you just don't see a thousand pieces of puzzle on the floor. You actually see the picture on the front of the box again. So, wow, Lord, you did it. I don't know how you did it. I wasn't even sure you were going to do it. But, Lord, you know I was trusting you. Noah was trying to trust the Lord. He was. Or he wouldn't have done all that, right? I believe in doing that, Noah learned to trust the Lord. And I think, 
I think Noah, at the end of building the ark, he kind of rather enjoyed it. All the mocking and all this, the mocking and the making fun of and all the name calling, you know. Because I felt, I, I believe that as Noah got to the end of the thing that God had asked him to do, I think there was a resolve. I think there was a trust that was being built between him and the Father. And I'm with you, Noah. I think there's things that took place in building that ark that was supernatural that only God could have done through his hands. Because he didn't know what he was doing. And so Noah's job was to rest in the ark. We've got the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant in Moses' tabernacle. Can you picture it in the Holy of Holies? You know what it looks like. The two cherubim. Guess what? The cherubim, their wings are touching a, a complete covering. Psalms 91. And also, they're facing and looking into the eyes of each other. They're looking into the faces. The faces of God. On that wall over there, representation of the faces, which is the fullness of the Godhead. And so, what would happen? Once a year, the high priest would be translated through the veil. You know, for, it's really cool. First of all, first of all, he'd stick his arm, something flesh, and stick it through something material. First, his arm would be translated. Okay, this is working. You know, with the, the uh, what do you call this, the, the, uh, the incense, whatever it, the thing is called that holds it, I can't remember. The censer. You know, and he's swinging it, filling the Holy of Holies up with the smoke, <laughs> the prayers. Mm. All of that, filling the presence. And then, take his arm back out. Oh, arm still here, okay. I think I can trust this. He'd step through. And what would happen when he'd come before the ark, the mercy seat over the ark? God would come and sit upon the ark. So, when we trust like Noah, by resting in him, he will respond by resting upon us. And what happens then? Restoration begins. God begins speaking and imparting the first thing God always says is his love. How much he loves us. He imparts his love to us. Okay, I'm going to move on. But Noah's Ark, seventh month, when it came to rest. Now, you gotta, this is good. When Noah's Ark came to rest, Noah's sitting in the ark, resting in him. Noah's resting in and God was resting upon it landed in the seventh month on the 17th day. 17, you catch it? The pay. 17th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the pay. The mouth that speaks is the decade that we've entered into. We're now in the 80. The decade of the 80s. We lived through one decade of the 80s. With the energy crisis and all that mess, you know. And the big hair, you know. All that stuff. You guys are really quiet. But anyway... The 17s, man. To me, 17 is redemption, full redemption. It's the right of redemption, actually. Because in Genesis, um, a prophet, is it? no, it's not in Genesis, it's in, I don't remember what book it's in. I have to look it up. But Jeremiah is in prison because he prophesied, he decreed the word of the Lord. He opened his big mouth because God opened his big mouth and spoke through him. And he told Israel and the king of Israel that they were going to be carried away for 70 years into Babylon as slaves, as captives. They didn't like that, so they locked, they locked him up. But then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And it was about receiving his inheritance. Because some land that was rightfully his has been sold off. And God gave him a dream and a word that he was going to be able to redeem. That he had the right of redemption to redeem that land. In other words, to receive his land, to receive his inheritance back. And it was paid for with the price of the right of redemption was 17 shekels of silver. So 17 speaks of redemption for me. It speaks of silver for me. And so 
Noah's ark rests upon a mountain in the seventh month, the seven, on the seventeenth day of pay. We're in the decade of the seventeenth. And it rested on this mountain called Ararat. Is what it says in the Bible. That's the word in Hebrew or English spelling. Ararat. Do you know what that word means? I'm talking about learning to sit in the seat of rest. The ark was like a seat of rest for Noah. He had to sit in the ark. He had to sit in the seat of rest. And he had to trust God to take care of everything. The word Ararat means the curse is reversed. That's what it means. So what was God saying to Noah on the top of that mountain? He was saying that the old day's gone. Because the flood wiped it away. And there was a new day dawning. And it would release the dove, you know. The first time the dove came back, but eventually the dove didn't come back. And that's how Noah knew it was time. There was a sign that it was time. Whenever God tells you to do something, He'll always give you a sign. He'll always let you know. You'll know that you know that it's time. Just don't get ahead of Him. Don't get behind Him. Just be with Him. Sit in that seat of rest with Him. So God was prophesying, showing Noah even with a sign of where he placed the ark. That the curse is broken, Noah. The curse has been reversed. Now see, this is, it's a sign. It's a picture for us. Where was the, the, the real curse? Where were all the curses reversed at? On the cross. On the cross, Jesus Christ became a curse for us. Because curses, everyone who hangs on a tree. Gen or Galatians chapter 3, I believe, is where it talks about that, right? And so Jesus was made a curse for us so that every curse is broken. Word curses. All those curses. Why? Because those things are what to keep you from stepping in and receiving your right of inheritance. Your right of redemption to receive the fullness of your inheritance. All that God has for you. You see... <laughs> It's out of the seat of rest that the Spirit will begin to birth His fruit in your life. What's the first fruit? Love. Seven represents complete, perfect fullness. The seventh month. Hmm. We just passed that, by the way, in the, in the month of Keshvan. That's how you say it. Keshvan. You know, that was, the, that was the month of the flood. That was also the month that Noah came out of the ark for a new day beginning. So, seven, the number seven represents completion, perfection, fullness, you know. And so, this is pretty cool. Um, so, I did a little study on the genealogy of Noah. Because Noah's name, find out where I did that at. Noah's name means rest, right? I haven't even talked about Noah yet, so let me talk about that for a minute. Noah, his name means rest. And his name is spelled with a noon, a vav, and a het, which means nothing to you. That's okay. But the numerical value is 19. So Noah's number is 19. So what does that say? Noah experienced a new day. Noah experienced a, a right of redemption, a right of inheritance. He got to inherit a new earth. He got a day that had a new creation, a new earth. All the curse was reversed. And Noah started again. Of course, we know what happens. You know, they end up screwing up again and all this stuff. Israel can't be faithful to the Lord. But that doesn't mean that God's not faithful to Israel, huh? Maybe we can't be faithful to the Lord. That doesn't mean the Lord's not faithful to us. That, just because we don't keep our word doesn't mean that God's not going to keep his word. Because he does. He always keeps his word. He's a man of his word. You can trust in his word. So Noah has a number of 19. And so I believe that 19 is a sign that we're coming into a new day. Because we're stepping out of the 19 into the 20, which is the number for head. And that's why, you know, that, that whole word the Lord gave me about the two heads. Because it's a 20-20, a double head. One's true, one's false. God's going to expose the false and cut it off. Just like David cutting off the head of Goliath. And this is, it's a, the Lord showed me it's a political spirit. It's a demonic Political, religious spirit that's operating in the church and has been operating and is operating in the world. In the government systems, in the leadership. That's where, because the head speaks of leadership, right? So why should it be weird to us when we start seeing leadership being exposed for operating falsely? For just not being upright, not being holy before the Lord. 
doing things a different way by, by a different spirit, by a different principality, by a different power. God is exposing that stuff. And God's going to cut it off. <laughs> See, he's removed the guard off of people's mouths so they can't help but speak what's in their heart. Good and bad. I'm telling you. <laughs> Did you ever say something? Wish you could take it back. <laughs> Once it's out, it's out. God has got to open our mouths and let us speak because we don't really know what's in our heart until it comes out of our mouth. So God is revealing our heart first to ourself and then to others. You know when he does that? When you don't repent yourself. If you re it's Matthew 18. It's the whole scenario. You sin. Your brother sins. Go to him. Restore your brother. That's the whole point is restoration. If he doesn't, then bring another brother with you. Two or three. In the mouth of two or three witnesses. But again, the purpose, the end result is restoration. Not annihilation. Not humiliation. Not destruction. The result is restoration. Because the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. There's a purpose for every gift. There's a purpose for every calling. There's a purpose for every life. There's a purpose for every person. That purpose is found in the maker of the thing. And the creator of the person. And I want to see every destiny fulfilled. I want to see my brother restored and lifted up. Not exposed and taken down. See, that's a different spirit. That's a false head operating. That's a principality. It's a demonic, religious, political spirit. Isn't that what politics is all about? I mean, it's based on evolution. That the strongest survive. And the weakest are destroyed or stepped on. That the most powerful will rise to the top. And forget about all the others. Because it's all about me. It's all about I. It's all about mine. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to be the king. Who does that sound like? I'm going to be God. It sounds like Satan. It sounds like Lucifer. So guess who's in charge of the false head? Guess who the head is over this head? Lucifer himself. Guess who, who the head is over true leadership, godly leadership? Jesus, the head of the church. Hallelujah. So anyway, the curse is reversed to the cross. No. I said I looked up the genealogy. So I went all the way from Adam all the way up to Noah. Actually from Noah all the way back to Adam. And you can find that in Genesis chapter 5. What's 5 represent? Grace. What does 5 also represent? Open heaven. It, it also represents eyes open to see. To behold. To see. Hmm. So Genesis 5. There's something to see here. That was hidden in plain sight. And that's the genealogy of the names. Of these fathers. All the way from Adam to Seth to Enos to Canaan to Mahalaleel. I can't even say that word. Yerod, Enoch. Everybody hear of Enoch? He was translated and was not. Methuselah, Lamech, and then Noah. Now get this. Hmm. This is good. At least I think it's good. Anyway, there's a lot of things I think are good. But actually from Adam, if you count Adam as the first generation of man in this creation, Noah would be the 10th generation. 10. What's a 10? Well, 19 has a 10 in it. A 19 is a 10 and a 9. In Hebrew, that's the way you'd look at it. Because everything is based on 10. What is 10? 10 is a number of foundation. 10 means a foundation. <laughs> and so, Noah is the 10th from Adam. The 10th generation. But Noah is the eighth generation from Seth. New beginnings. A new, what? A new beginning laying a new foundation. Okay, a beginning, a divine order. Ten also is a number of divine order. Ordinal perfection, right? That's what ten. Seven is divine perfection. Ten is ordinal perfection. Or a perfect order. Divine order being set. See, that, that's why God's doing all this stuff and allowing to be done what's happening right now. He's bringing the divine order to creation. He's destroying the chaos, which is the opposite of divine order. That's disorder. And he's removing it and bringing divine order. And so I just looked up the meaning of all the names of these 
fathers. And so this is what, this genealogy from Adam to Noah, because it's a picture. I'm telling you, it's a picture. And what did Matthew say? What does the book of Matthew say? That as in the days of Noah, the ending will be as in the days of Noah. So that's why Noah is important. That's why rest is important. That we learn how to rest in the, and take our seat. Sit in rest. Because then God will come up on that seat of rest. He will come up on you. He will cover you. Everywhere that I was looking up the meaning of rest and all the different Hebrew words that meant rest. It, all of them spoke about God covering. About something being hidden. Something being concealed. Something being protected. See, Noah was protected inside the ark. See, when the high priest would step in, if there was no sin, <laughs> the high priest would actually engage with the father that was manifesting him the presence like an open heaven, open portal, open heaven above the mercy seat. And the high priest would be taken in, would step into the heavenly realms. And actually he would take the blood. Guess what? He would sprinkle it seven times. Actually, one place it says with his fingers. He would dip his fingers in the blood. And sprinkle seven times on the mercy seat. Why? Because seven is the number of redemption. Seven is the number of fullness. Seven is the number of completion. It was that season, that year was being completed. So that what? There could be a new year. There would be another year. There would be another reset. You know, another word for, for rest is the word Shemitah. Or Shema, which we get the word Shemitah. You've heard of a Shemitah? It's a seven year season. At the end of seven years, the land would rest for a year. Every seven years, the Jews understood that the land needed to rest. If the land needs to rest, so does man. Man needs to learn to rest. And so we got to rest in him. And so every seven years, there's a reset. Okay? And then there's seven sevens, seven Shemitahs, 49 years. And then what do you have? You have the great rest restoration, a restoration, a resetting. You've got the restoration of all things on the 50th year. Guess what the gematria of the, the letter Nun, which is the letter, the 14th letter for Messiah, which we know is Jesus, right? The numerical value of that letter is 50. That's why the Jubilee is 50. I believe there is a great Jubilee, a great restoration that, that we are just stepping into. I believe it's the, the fulfilling of all things. It's the restoration of all things that Romans chapter 8 talks about. So anyway, back to this genealogy. So this is what all these names going all the way from Noah back to Adam. Okay, that's called restoration. As it was in the beginning. The ending will equal the beginning. The ending of a thing in Hebrew thinking will always equal the ending. The ending will equal the beginning. Because in Hebrew everything's circular. Nothing's linear. You don't have a starting and stopping point and pff, that's it. Everything along the way is lost. It's just the past so forget it. No, it's circular. So when you come back around, nothing's lost. Everything is redeemed. The full restoration of all things. And so, this is what the names mean of all those men. You're going to like this because this is, a, this is a, the secret. This is a key to rest. Here's some understanding for you. Rest is a powerful weapon. That's what the first two names mean. Noah, rest, is a powerful weapon. Which one? Nope, not which. Rest is a powerful weapon when one is, one dedicates and humbles himself to praise God. And rest is a possession to man. See, it's part of your inheritance. Is a possession to man as compensation. That's what Seth means, compensation. Because of the father's blood being spilled through his son on a cross. That's rest. It's a powerful weapon when we dedicate and humble ourselves and praise God. It's a possession as compensation because of the Father's blood being spilled through a son. Okay. I want to move out of that.
And I want to be in, move into, man, it's hot. I'm hot. <laughs> yeah, how, I turned them all up today. Boy, did I. Hallelujah. I want to move into the mercy seat. I want to talk a little bit more about that. So it's the last thing I'm going to talk about. And I'm just going to let you know what we're going to do. Okay. I'm going to play because the Lord, I woke up. Actually, before I woke up, the Lord was singing this song. The song was going over in my spirit. Back in the 90s, I believe it was the 90s, this song came out. And we sang it in church a lot. I'm running to the mercy seat. Running to the mercy seat. This morning, that's the altar call. We're going to run to the mercy seat of God together. Okay. And so, um, thank you, Lord. There's another word is found in 2 Daniel chapter 23, verse 8. And it's, it's actually two words in Hebrew. I probably should read that verse. But anyway, but for sake of time, I'm not going to. But you're going to trust me. There's two words in Hebrew. And, it, and the words together is talking about the seat of rest. Yosheb ba sheba shebeth. I don't, I don't speak Hebrew, but anyway. It's two Hebrew words. And when you put them together, okay, this is really good. Because the one word means to, to dwell or remain. The second word means a sitting still, like to rest. To cease from labor. Sitting in the seat. Cessation. You ever hear about the doctrine of cessationism? Because this is the only cessation I believe in. Is me resting from my own works. I believe in that. I'll stop my own works and I'll rest in the works of the Lord. To keep the Sabbath. It, but it also means to destroy, exterminate, and remove. And so these words, Yashab, Ba, Shabeth. This is a fuller meaning. The power, by the power of God, God's hand will by fire destroy all chaos and create that habitation of perfection in his house. And you're his house. That's what rest does. Destroys all chaos. Creates a habitation of perfection in us, which is his house. And then he dwells in his house with us. Okay. Now. There's, a, there's another word. I'm getting to the mercy seat. There's another word that is used for um, the word seated. Okay, the seat of, or seated in rest. It's the word kesa, or actually the first word is sophon. It's found in Deuteronomy 33, verse 21. And it simply means to cover, to hide by covering. See, it's in, if you read Deuteronomy 33, what's taking place when this word is used for seat or to be seated it's where Moses is the seat where Moses sits to execute justice and judgment. And so, see, the seat of rest is the place of judgment and justice. Moses would sit in the seat. See, uh, the seat is a throne, is a seat of authority. The seat of rest is a place of authority. It is a throne. God enthroned himself upon the mercy seat. Moses would sit upon the throne as a king and he would make righteous judgments. And that's the key. Righteous judgments. Righteous verdicts. Righteous decrees. Moses would have to see and hear into heaven to bring what? Justice. Judgment brings justice. Righteous judgments bring a righteous justice. And so the seat of rest, a seat, is a place to bring justice. Anybody want some justice? I do. I really do. In Judges chapter 3 verse 20, there's another word for, for seat, arrest, and it's the word ehud. And, and this is the name of a judge, again, a judge in Israel that is sitting on this seat, this kaseph of rest, a seat of honor, a throne, a seat of authority, a seat of power, a canopy of covering. All that stuff is a seat in Hebrew. But ehud... Um, it's a very unique word, and it means to be united. Undivided union. And so when we learn to sit in a seat of rest, that's when the unity comes. That's when we become united and not divided. First, you have to learn to sit in Him. 
Moses had to sit in the, in the ark. And then God set upon him. God would set up on the seat that was established. And he still does today. Okay. It comes, the kaseth, kasa, kaseh, however you say it, comes from the root word kasa, which means to cover, to cancel, to clothe, to hide in secrecy. So I want to enter into that seat of rest. I want to learn how to go into the mercy seat. Because when that place, God's going to cover me. God's going to hide me. God's going to envelop canopy over and around me. And I'm going to be immersed in God. And when I'm sitting, sitting in rest, God will sit upon me. God will sit upon and begin to manifest his presence around me. And all of a sudden, I'm in a place of perfect peace. I'm in his presence. And so, let's go. And I want to read this verse. This is, this is the ending. This is where I'm going to land this rocket this morning. Okay? It's Exodus chapter 25. And I do want to read this one out loud. Hmm. As soon as I see what my wife sent me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, happy wife, happy life. I understand that. I'm not stupid. I've learned a few things. <laughs> the hard way. The hard way, yeah. Still learning the hard way sometimes. Verse 17. So, what did I say, Genesis? I'm in Exodus. Exodus 25. It'd be helpful if I'll be in the right book. The right part of the word. Exodus 25, 17. I'm going to read from 17 to 22. Okay, and this is really good. This is talking about the mercy seat. This is where God, through Moses, is instructing Bezalel and others to, to fashion the ark, to fashion the mercy seat, which was the covering of the ark, the lid, if you will. What well, we're in a day of revealing, taking the lid off. That's what apocalypto in Greek to reveal the, re the word revelation, apocalypto, means to take the lid off, to remove the lid. So that's what God's doing. He's removing the lid so everything's inside can be exposed, so that which is not of him can be removed. Hallelujah. Don't you want to be a pure vessel? I want to be a Zadok. I don't want to just be Levi. I don't want to be just a Levite. Because most of the Levites were compromising and sinning. <laughs> and merchandising the gospel and trading illegally. In the outer court, which is the only place of ministry they were allowed to go because of the sin in the camp. But the Zadoks remained in the holy place and the holy of holies because they were pure of heart. Because they had the heart like David. They were faithful to King David in his reign where the Levites weren't. But the Zadoks were. The Zadoks were actually Levites. But they were a group within a group. They were a church within a church. They were a priesthood within a priesthood. Okay. So verse 17. And thou shalt make a mercy seat. That's the word kapora. Kaporeth. I don't say. However. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. And that is the same word for gold there that's used back in Genesis. First time the word gold is introduced has a gematria of 19. Another 19. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. Basically, eight foot by five foot. Okay? You get a picture. And thou shalt make two cherubim, cherubs, of gold, of beaten work, shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. So you got these pictures, right, of these cherubs, these cherubim. That's the plural. Being formed, by the way, out of one solid piece of gold. No division, just unity. Complete, united piece of gold. He formed this out of it. You know, you got to be pretty good. That's got to be a pretty good chunk of gold too, by the way. <laughs> and the cherubs shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. So why is it a good time to learn how to sit in the seat of rest or to learn how to sit in the mercy seat? Because God's wings will be over you. He will cover you with his wing. Psalms 91. With their wings. And also, you know, Rex has a prayer shawl. I don't know what's not up there. But uh, the Jews had a prayer shawl, right? And the ends, the tassels, the talits. Okay? Those were the wings. <laughs> Covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat. 
shall the faces of the cherubim be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. There's a good reason to be in the mercy seat. God's going to meet with us and commune there. From between the two cherubs. Which are upon the ark. So you're with the angels here. Not just the angels. The archangels. The three uh, categories of angels that are around his throne. The cherubim, the seraphim, and the ophanim. Okay, the ark of the testimony of all things, which I will command thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. And then, um, so that's the last verse. That's as far as I want to go. Now, in Hebrew, there were some words used there, but I want to bring out, I want to talk about this one word for the seat of, or the word for mercy seat here. Kaporeth. Okay, it's a mercy seat. Just says out of Strong's. A place of atonement. Remember the high priest would sprinkle the blood. The place of atonement. And what did Jesus do? Jesus took his own blood through the cross and he ascended into heaven with his blood, which was the Father's blood. And he sprinkled it upon the mercy seat in the heavenly holy of holies seven times. And that took place on the day of atonement. In the earth, there was a day of atonement, right? When the high priest went in once a year, one time to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat called the day of atonement. In other words, the atonement for all sin that had been committed for that last year. Well, Jesus did it, what, for every year, for always, forever and ever and ever. The seat in heaven, that's an eternal seat of mercy. The eternal seat of... Aren't you glad that there is an eternal, eternal seat of mercy? His mercies... That's why His mercies are new every morning. Because they're flowing out of the mercy seat of heaven. Because atonement, the perfect blood, the eternal blood has been sprinkled. As a, it's, they sprinkle the blood, this, this word kapora, a sign of reconciliation. Reconciling all things to himself. That's what Jesus did. It was made of gold. One piece of gold. Talked about the cherubim already. It's a picture of the throne of God. Uh, it has, I love this. It has a gematria. This word for mercy seat. Has a gematria of 700. What's 700? 700 is 7 times 100. That's perfection. That's divine fullness. That's divine perfection. That, that's the... the culmination that's why there's got to be seven thousand years and then there's the the kingdom millennium coming so 700 seven seven is perfect is fullness 100 you know is is i mean you can't score any better than that everything is perfect but it's not in our efforts it's not in our works it's not in the test we take it's in the test that he took for us and he passed 100 percent. right all in <laughs> The high priest would speak. So when I looked up the word Kaporeth, this is the meaning by the letters, the pictures of the letters. The high priest speaks the blessing of full redemption over the whole nation. Now in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, it was to cover their sins. But we got a high priest now, after the order of Melchizedek, forever seated in the heavenlies, seated, by the way, on a throne, the seat of a throne of mercy, the mercy seat. And so the high priest speaks the blessing of full redemption over the church, over the holy nation, the, the, the nation of many nations, but those that have called upon the name of the Lord, washed in the blood of Jesus. What? To cleanse. The high priest speaks the blessing. You know, the high priestly blessing found in the book of Numbers chapter 6, I think, verse 20 something. Whatever, wherever it is, the high priestly blessing, you know, I bless you, the Lord keep you, make his face shine upon you and give you peace and blah, blah, blah. That's powerful. Anyway, the high priest, Jesus, speaks the blessing of full redemption. Say full redemption. See, you got to believe full redemption. That's the redemption of all things. That what was and what would have been. The blessing of full redemption over the whole nation to cleanse all sin. Yeshua did that for us. And it's an ongoing, that word is forever and ever and ever. Rest is a powerful weapon. Noah rested. God rested. Jesus rested. The church has to come to a place of rest. Where you cease from your own works. Just like God did from his. And you settle down. You set in. You settle in to a place of resting. 
a resting place, a seat of rest. The kasa, the covering, where God then covers you, envelops you with the canopy of His glory, His presence. Okay, the New Testament. One verse. This is the last thing that I saw a while ago, and I, I don't want to leave it out. This is important. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, verse 12. It says, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. That word seat there means, it's the word in Greek, cathedral. Cathedral or cathedral. I don't know how they say it. You know, we built great cathedrals. This is not a good thing here. <laughs> Jesus comes with the whip and drives all the money changers out, turns all the tables over, and the seats of them that sold doves. See, isn't that interesting? That it says the tables and the seats. Why? Because the seats were a place of idolatry. These seats were actually thrones. And the men were sitting upon these thrones because they were supposed to be the priests. That the people would bring their offering to. You know. Under the Moses' uh, covenant. The old covenant. And they were merchandising the gospel. They were trading. Just like the Levites back in Moses' tabernacle had done. Now in the temple of Solomon. They're doing the same thing. Nothing's changed. There hasn't been a heart change. The, the priesthood is still polluted. The motives of the heart are still wrong. And so they're sitting on these seats or these cathedrals. I'm telling you, priests are still sitting in cathedrals. That word means an exalted seat. A seat occupied by men of rank and influence. <laughs> it means a bench. A judgment seat. Okay, and so they were releasing unrighteous justice. Unrighteous decree. Unrighteous judgments. Because they were... They were they were making trades with the people that they weren't supposed to be making trades. They were allowing exceptions for this. And they were requiring a little more for that. And they were letting excuses be made. They were corrupt. The priesthood was corrupted. That's why Jesus came. Was to establish a new pure priesthood of believers. Called the order of Melchizedek. Patterned after the Zadok priesthood. <laughs> the heavenly priesthood. This is the seat. This word is the same word used where it talks about Pontius Pilate sitting on his seat to judge Jesus when they brought him before him. A raised place. You got to get this. You know another word for it? This is right out of the Greek Strong's Concordance. A tribunal. That word's been thrown around a lot lately if you've been following Todd Bentley. A tribunal. Seats. Thrones. Set on a throne. A raised place. <laughs> See, there are true benches. There are true seats of authority. But they were also false. They were in the earth with Jesus. And I'm telling you, they're still here today. And the, the spirit behind them is an unclean, a demonic, political, religious spirit operating. Just like it operated through the Pharisees, it's still operating today. Matthew eleven twenty eight and 29. This is going to be in the Amplified. Jesus says this. Come to me. All you who are weary. And are heavy laden. And overburdened. And I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest, relief and ease and refreshment and recreation, recreation and blessed quiet for your souls. That's the Amplified. Why did Jesus say, take my yoke upon you? Because Israel understood that. The Jews understood what he meant. Because their practice, they were agricultural people. They had oxen that would plow the fields. What an interesting that. The word lamp or yeah, lamp this morning, the root one of the root words means to plow the field. 
See, I believe God is releasing fresh fire and favor. And also, why? For a fresh field. For a new field. He's going to launch people into new fields of ministry. New fields of harvesting. Hmm. Okay. So what Israel would do, they would take the old oxen, not old as in old and feeble and not strong, but old as in trained. Old as in meat. Strength under authority. Strength, power under control. They would take the trained ox, the old ox, and Jesus was referring as, I'm the old oxen. I am the trained oxen. I, I am the oxen with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And they would joke a young ox that hadn't been broken yet, that hadn't been trained, that was even smaller in stature than the old oxen. And they would yoke them together. That's what Jesus said, take my yoke, because I'm the old ox here. You're the young ox, and you're going to learn of me. You're going to be my disciple. See, the old ox would disciple the young ox. And they would send them out into the field. Guess what? The ox didn't get to pick the field they went to. The master did. The ox didn't get to decide what they were going to plow. The master did. The oxen, his job was to be a servant. His job was to humble himself and to serve the master. <laughs> That's what taking a yoke on means. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And you will find rest for your souls. So we're going to yoke up with Jesus. Amen.